Good evening, Margaret. It's Yasleen. I'm sorry this is getting to you so late, but I had to run out this evening, so I'm running a little bit behind. But nevertheless, I promised you I would send you home buyer information tonight, and you shall have it. In fact, you're very fortunate because I am starting a 10-part series on buying a home. So you will be the first to hear this, <laughs> at least in this format anyway. So sit back. Hope you got a little something to eat. A little bottle of water because it might take a few minutes but it'd be well worth it okay first of all we talked a little bit today about the first thing you need to do is speak with a lender you need to speak with a lender before you even go looking out at anything why because first of all we've got to establish your level of buying power and when i say buying power i mean how much money can we really spend on a home and what would you be looking at as far as the down payment and the closing costs and other associated fees and incidentals when you are looking for a home. So that has got to be step one because that will affect everything else. Okay, once we've established buying power, then we can start honing in on your desired area. I know you had mentioned um, Roswell Sandy Springs area, which is beautiful. Um, but you need to know the average home price in that area starts at about 250000 going up. And these are not new homes. These are older homes. Are they building new homes? Absolutely. They are building like all over the place right now. It is crazy. As I said earlier, new construction is the way. If we can get you new construction, that's what we need to be looking at. Because that's going to give you the biggest bang for your buck. And... You get to choose your lot. It's something to be said for going into a new house and you are exactly where you want to be in the subdivision. I don't know if you ever lived anywhere before, but you if you ever wish that, gosh, I wish I lived at the back of the subdivision or I wish I lived on that corner or I wish I could have been in the mouth of the cul-de-sac. And I always try to point this out to my people who are looking at new construction. The mouth of the cul-de-sac and corners. They are premium lots. However, when they, the old, remember the old saying that said fences make good neighbors? Space between neighbors make good neighbors too. If you have, you know you have company a lot, it's definitely crucial for you to be in a cul-de-sac or on a corner. Why? Because you got all that room around to get to the next house. Or if you're in the mouth of the cul-de-sac, you got your driveway. And then you got space in between in that curve for your company where you're not blocking your neighbors. So those type of things are important when you're looking at new construction. Now, if you're going into an already established neighborhood or what have you, you know, we, we do what we can to try to find you a corner lot or be in the mouth of the cul-de-sac. It just depends. I know you said you wanted, you know, a little bit of land so you could do some planning. And I fully understand I am a garden kind of girl myself. So I understand the need to be somewhere where you can plant your little garden, flowers, put a little fountain in. You know, I tell people all the time, you know, you can have a small space, but you can always go up. So if you've got a smaller backyard, maybe you ought to put in a pergola. You still got the same amount of square feet, but you created more. You got just as much space going up as you got out. So, just a thought, just a thought way down the line. I know we're jumping the gun, but just a thought. Okay, so that we need to keep into consideration once we start looking at, you know, your desired area and home prices. Then, what I would need you to do, once we found the area that you want to be in, say it's not new construction, I really want you to drive the neighborhood before you see the house. Why? Because... That is going to be your domicile until you decide to put it back up for sale. So you need to know, is it a lot of kids always in the street? Is it too far from work? Is it a lot of traffic? You know, there are some subdivisions when you first come in, they're on busy, off busy highways. So you got to take into consideration, you got to get to the other side to go in the opposite direction. Now, if you got to go in the other direction, you're good. But nevertheless, you definitely want to check out the neighborhood and drive at different times of the day because you want to see what's going on. You don't want to get in there and it's like, oh my God, I have made the biggest mistake. Because when you go see the home, nothing might be going on. 
It might be quiet. It might be peaceful. Nobody might be out in the middle of the street. What have you. But you want to make sure that neighborhood looks like it looks all day. Or at least most of the time. Or either something that you can learn to live with. So that's my reasoning for you driving the neighborhood before we go see the house. Because you want to see things like they're just going on without you being around, what have you, so you know. Okay, once you drive the neighborhood, then let's start making some showing appointments. Um, since COVID-19, there's so much going on now with, um, they've changed the way we show. We can do virtual tours where I can go to the house, take the pictures, what have you, put it on video like I'm doing tonight, and send it over to you. And it's like, okay, is this what you want to move forward with? If not, we do have a Safe Fire program that we've instituted right now, and I've attached that to this email so that you can see what exactly it is we do to make sure that you're safe and where we're going is safe. All right. Once after we do that, we're on to step five. See, we're halfway there. That didn't take that long. And we are six minutes and 16 seconds in. We're doing pretty good tonight. Okay. Now, once we find a home of your dreams and that you have almost fallen in love with, and I say almost because I don't want you in love. I really, really don't want you deep in love until the day of closing. Why? Because things happen. We could get outbidded. We might get a bad home inspection. It might not appraise and they're not willing to work with us. I don't want you to be so attached to a property that you can't move on. I've had a lot of people who have had that experience and they were just so blown out of the water. And it's like, that's just one house. We will find another house. Might take a little bit longer, but this is a journey. Okay, so. Just keep those things in mind. Once we find a house that you are almost in love with, we make the offer. What's in the offer? Let's go over the parts of the offer. Number one, we'll give whatever our purchase price is. We'll ask for closing costs if needed. We'll ask for certain closing dates. We'll put the amount of earnest money, due diligence period, Special stipulation, finance, and contingency. Okay, so I'm going to break that down even further. Our purchase price will be whatever our purchase price offer is. If the house is $250 and I look at the comps, which I will look at before we submit the offer to see exactly how much was the last house that sold in this neighborhood? How long did it stay on the market? What did the seller offer for closing costs? Each seller is going to be different. And like I tell everyone, closing costs is it gift not a right let me say it one more time closing cost is a gift and not a right just because you give them full ass still does not mean that will be enough to push that seller to giving you an acceptance i've had it to happen several times in the past two years and we gave them full ass you never know what's going on on the other side of the transaction a lot of times people owe people for work they may have had done in the house. They may have had a second taken out on that house where they still got another piece of loan, a line of credit, whatever the case may be. It might not even be enough in the equity. They may not have been in the house that long. So it's probably just enough in there for them to pay off the house and pay the agents and that's it. So we definitely have to keep that, you know, as a part of our strategy going in. So take that into consideration when we're asking for closing costs. Next day, day of closing. Day of closing is your choice. Um, on a good offer, they really don't want to see any more than 30 days. If it's new construction, you will probably be 45, 60, maybe 120 days. That's the beauty of home new um, construction. New construction you will be required to put down what's called a deposit. That deposit takes the property off the market, very similar to earnest money, which is usually 1% of the um, offer, offer amount. On a deposit on new construction, they want, depending on who the builder is, it could be anywhere from $500 to $5,000. It just depends on the builder. 
mill ground, they're usually asking for $2,500. That money does go towards your purchase price or it can be used towards your options in the house and what are options. Let's just say the base model is $250,000. That's just whatever the builder chose. It may have granite, it may not. It may not have 42 inch cabinets. It may not have the fancier faucets. It may have a level one flooring versus a level three flooring. And if we go to construction, you'll see what I'm talking about when I say level one, level three. So it just depends. Of course, level one is the basic. Level three is gonna be your upgraded. So it could go towards that. Generally what they offer is some closing costs. Builders now, once upon a time, you could get it all paid, but they, they flipped the script. You may have to pay some of your closing costs on new construction, and even then, you will still, to get that, you may have to go with one of their preferred lenders. Um, I work with a lender who is a preferred lender to several builders, and I will include that information in this email as well, so you can take a look at the subdivisions that they cover, and that could be a good option for you. And in fact, one of them, I know New American Funding, if you go with them, you not only would be able to get your closing costs, but you get an you get additional stuff. So just depending on the community, all communities are different. So it would just be depending on what the builder is offering. So we want to keep that in mind. Next, we talk about due diligence period. That will be the next thing on the contract. Your due diligence period is the time when you're getting your home inspection done and you're basically, you know, kicking the tires on it a little bit trying to figure out, you know, is this house really up to snuff? You're checking for, you know, the home inspector is going to check for leaks, for the electrical, for plumbing. If the house is on a septic tank, that's a separate inspection. We would have to get a plumber to come out. And of course, if it's on a septic, I'm going to ask, well, when was the last time this septic was pumped? Um, when was the last time you changed out the lines? All of those things would have to be done within our due diligence period that time frame anywhere from well back before all of this i could get a home inspection done tops three days four at the most maybe if it's like over a weekend but if it's during the week three days but things have changed we have COVID 19 now it's a little different so generally what i put in on due diligence period is about 10 days 10 days is fair um, I always put in these special stipulations, which we will talk about next. Um, our due diligence period does not include any weekends because we have no control over people on weekends. I mean, <laughs> there's only so much you can control Monday through Friday, but definitely not on the weekend. So I would never put you or any of my clients in a position to where their due diligence period went over a weekend and they were counting those days in the 10 days that we asked for. 10 days is sufficient. That's time enough for them to get out there. Well, first of all, we had to get on somebody's calendar. That gives them time to get out there, take a look at the at the house to make sure everything is good and to get us the report. And then we go back to the seller if there are issues. If there are issues, we submit what is called an amendment to address concerns with the property. And that could be anything. There could have been a leak under the sink. Okay, now, first of all, when we start asking for repairs, my most professional advice to you is please, please, please do not ask the seller to make the repairs. The reason I don't want you to ask the seller to make the repairs is because they are going to do it as cheaply as they can. If you do it, it's going to be done right because you've got a vested interest. They're just trying to move on. They don't have your interest at heart. You're more invested than they would be in that position. And in fact, I did have a situation like that just last year. We had some concerns with the property. And I, I told my client, please just ask for a credit. Ask for something off the house. But please don't let them do the repair. They was like, no, we, you know, we really want them to do it. I'm like, okay, but you're running the risk that it's not going to be done correctly or won't be done at all. Well, here we come the day before closing on our final walkthrough and some things were not done correctly. 
were they detrimental? That's subjective. I wasn't happy about it because I'm like, wow, you know, I thought, you know, we would do right. But I told them then, I was like, this is why I asked you to ask for a credit and not let them do the repairs. Do them yourself. But they went on. They really love the house. And, and I mean, they got a good deal on it. Don't get me wrong. For the size of house they got, for the price they got it for, you can't find that now. That, that's, that's, that's just not the question. And it's just been in the past six months. So, I definitely, you know, would encourage you to ask for credit. We get an estimate and say, okay, it's going to cost X amount of dollars for us to get this repaired. So, we would, you know, address the seller. And it's like, hey, Mr. Seller, we're asking for X amount of dollars for repairs. But X, Y, and Z, be happy to submit the um, estimate to you. So they don't think that we just pulling some number out of a hat. So that is my advice to you when it comes to due diligence and your repairs. Okay. Next, special stipulations. What is in special stipulations? In special stipulations, we talk about what we want outside of the offer price, close date, amount of earnest money we're willing to submit, and our due diligence period. Special stipulations is for things like, okay, I want to see a termite letter, a termite clearance letter. And if there are issues, I want you all to fix it before close. That's the only type of repair I, I'm strong on because it falls back on the termite company and you've got a warranty. So if anything goes wrong, you got somebody to go to say, okay, fix this. We got a warranty. It'll be paid for. It won't come out of your pocket. So that's the only thing when it comes to repairs. I'm okay with that much because we're not dealing with necessarily the seller doing it because they've got to provide us proof of that. So I'm, I'm comfortable with that because then we go, I'm sorry, get the company. Okay. Next thing I ask for. If it's in a HOA, can we get a copy of the covenants and restrictions? You want to know what if you're able to lease the house out if you need to. You need to know if there are paint colors you can't put out. You'd be surprised what's in those HOA docs. So we definitely need to have those at closing, if not before, so we know what to expect going into that community. We need to know what the HOA fees cover. We need to know who we need to contact at the HOA. And like I encourage everybody, get on the board. It makes a difference. When you're a part of the process, it makes a difference. So we definitely ask for that. And maybe there's something in the house you might want. Like, oh, I really want to make sure they leave that, that fixture. Or I want to make sure that all these nice appliances that are there stay with the property at no further cost to the buyer. Those, it's just little things like that you really have to put out in writing because I've had other agents tell me they went back, you know, on the walkthrough, refrigerator gone, stove gone, dishwasher gone. It's like, well, you didn't put it in the contract. It means nothing if it's not in writing. So that is what we do on our special stipulation, things that are going to follow after the closing. Then we move on to your financing contingencies and appraisal. What is your financing contingency? Number one, we will ask for, since we are now in COVID-19, 24 days versus the usual 17 days I'll ask for. That is a time period when the lender goes through your docs hard. They make sure that you're still employed. And now they are checking employment, not only prior to your pre-approval, but on the day of closing to make sure you still are employed. That's the way they did when I bought my house. People have told me, well, they've gotten away from that. They've gone back to it now. So that's when they make sure that your credit is what it said it is. They've done all the background work on you and your financing just to make sure that you are solid and they're going to approve this loan for you. Not only are they checking you out, they're checking the house out. That's when the appraisal comes in. 
The appraisal is ordered after the due diligence period. It's not ordered before because we could get into a situation where due diligence might have to be extended for whatever reason. There might be a need for reinspection. We don't know. So they want to make sure that we are moving forward on this offer before they order the appraisal. Now, the appraisal is about anywhere from 450, 550, depends on the loan, depends on the lender. But generally, please put aside that money along with your earnest money because that money has to be paid to your lender to get that done. Now, once the appraisal is ordered, they're going to go out to the property, take a look at it, and it could come back with some lender required repairs. And that will vary from lender to lender, appraiser to appraiser. I've seen things come up on an inspection report. And when we got to the appraisal, the lender was like, I don't know what you're talking about. Our appraisal went out and everything was fine. So it, it just varies. But if the house is not appraised, only two things that can happen. Well, three. Either the seller would have to lower the price, we would have to meet them halfway, or we walk away. That would be a decision you would have to make. How often do appraisals come in under asking? Sometimes. Sometimes. I had one back in 2017, 2018. I think it was 2017. The appraisal came in about 25000 less than asking price. Last year, when my broker was buying a house, his appraisal came in like 50000 under. So, I mean, that's major. So, they had to have a meeting of the minds to make the deal work. So, you have to think about that. But let's just say for all rights and purposes, the appraisal comes back perfect. It appraises at asking price, if not better. So, at that point, the appraiser is good with that. Your file goes to underwriting for another review. If everything is good with that, you will receive what is called a clear to close, which means we are almost there. We almost at the finish line. You can be like, oh, it took long enough. I was stressed. That's when you can take a deep breath. So that's going to be your clear to close. So what happens after your clear to close? We schedule our final walkthrough, which is element number nine. You will go back to the property, look and make sure everything is like it was when we saw the property initially, or since we've gone in and out of due diligence for whatever might have needed to be done, if you request lender repairs or you request repairs in the due diligence process. So once we go through the walkthrough, you're happy, like, Okay, so tomorrow's it. Yep, tomorrow's it. Then you can go to close. Whew. Finally, we can go to closing. What is closing like? A lot of people get really stressed out at closing because it is a lot of paperwork. You are signing, 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 signing. And it's like, it gets real. What I used to do is take pictures of the buyers when they're doing all their paperwork and give them give it to them in a collage after closing and they look back at those pictures like gosh what was i thinking at that moment because at that moment when you are signing that paper there's a lot of stuff going through your head you don't you're there but it's like i just want to get through all this paperwork so you would at least have those memories because of COVID 19 by the time we get ready to close i can't tell you what it's going to be like I, I really can't because I just honestly don't know. Nobody does. So we'll see what happens at that point. Once you sign all your paperwork, you'll get a file by yay thick. Bind it. Keep up with your paper. And by all means, get the best title insurance policy you can get. The closing attorney will go over that with you. That covers if any liens come up, if a contract is just pop up out of the blue well they owe me eighteen hundred dollars because i fixed a hole in their roof four years ago you have nowhere to dispute any of that claim title insurance takes care of that 
Nobody can come up to you and say you owe them anything or something is owed to them on that property. You will be covered under that title insurance policy. So that's that. Then, not last but least, you get your keys. You get your keys. You get your keys. Then you walk away and you enjoy your home and you think about the journey that it took to get there. Well, that's it. That is that is going to be like my 10 part series that I just did for you in 25.26, 25 minutes and 26 seconds. If you have any further questions after this, please let me know. I hope I provided you enough information of what to expect in the process. Yes, there will be some bumps in the road. We never know what those bumps will be. So I would definitely advise you to pack your patience and just breathe. It's all a part of the process. If you don't get the house on the first offer, it's okay. There are other houses out there. You know, you may, you might be the, you know, dodge the bullet. So sometimes when you don't get the house, it's okay. Maybe there's something better out there. You definitely have to take it all in stride because home buying process is, can be a very stressful process. I do my best to block as much as I can and to make it as seamless as I can for all my buyers as well as all my sellers. Things will happen along the way. There are very few transactions where nothing happens, where it's like, okay, you get accepted offer, diligence, finance contingency, appraisal, clear to close, we're done. That's very rare. And even with new construction, pack your patience. That's why I suggested new construction because number one, it gives a lot of time for you to get in that house. Um, with, the, with the way things are going right now, you know, builders and everything are behind. So if you find something right now, nine times out of 10, it's not gonna be ready before the end of the year anyway, depending on what you choose. Things happen. People stop working. People start working. People stop working. People start working. All of those things go into place. They may not be able to get materials right. So you stretching that out to the end of the year is perfect because if they can't get the flooring in or they can't get the granite slabs, or they can't get the paint right, or they can't pour the slab. I just came out of a deal last month. Um, young man with new construction and the on-site agent was telling me how frustrated so many of the other buyers were because they were like, what are y'all going to pour foundation? They can't pour foundation if it's raining. It's got to be dry for them to pour foundation. So all of that pushes everything else back. So new construction, if we can get into it and get you a good price, definitely the way to go because you got time. I don't advise anybody to look at new construction unless, number one, the builder already has standing inventory that they do not have contracts on. That's, that's a perfect marriage. That's a perfect marriage. But if they are still doing things, if they're just at the framing stage or they haven't done electrical or they hadn't done plumbing, all that kind of stuff, that pushes your timeline away. So being further out is really a good thing. I mean, I'm sure you'd be, you know, anxious to get in your house, but at the same time, you won't have that pressure like, okay, my lease is up in 25 days and they have not poured foundation. There's no way I'm getting ready to move next month. So I've got to either extend my lease or go stay with a relative or go to an extended stay until my house is finished. The weather here in Georgia, as you know, is fickle. Snow one day, sunshine in the next. Just like that, it's almost May the 1st. And guess what? It's 40 degrees. So, that's it. I'm not going to go on. I'm not going to keep going because I know you're probably tired by now. So, I'm almost running 30 minutes on this. But that has been your personal private home buyer seminar. Um, like I said, if you have any further questions, please feel, to re feel free to reach out to me. And I look forward to working with you and getting you into a home. You have a great evening and thank you for your patience um, for being up this late waiting on me. <laughs> I'll talk to you soon, Margaret. Bye-bye.